All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to a very, very special episode on the Cosmic Matrix podcast with your host, Bernard Gunther. And my very special guests are two of my favorite people in the world right now. Um, and very inspiring uh, fellas, David Whitehead from Unslaved and uh, Truth Warrior podcast and John Paul Rice, both individuals I had on the podcast as well. And I was on David's podcast. I was soon going to be on John's podcast. He has something going on as well. So thank you so much, guys, for participating. Happy to be here, brother. Thanks for having us. This is going to be fun. Yeah. It's good, to, good to see everybody's smiling face again exactly. live. <laughs> no, I'm so excited. Yeah. Um, before we dive in, into various topics, um, introduction, you know, a little bit maybe, and also sh tell people where we can, where they can find you these days, because with all the censorship, and I know you guys started some new streaming platforms and all of that. So just tell our listeners where we can find you. Okay. John, why don't you go first, brother? All yeah. right. Uh, yeah. So John Paul Rice, uh, independent film producer from No Restrictions Entertainment. I had spent uh, 21 years in the film industry Got my start, remember the Titans. And then in 2017, after Donald Trump's election, I kind of found my way down a rabbit hole into human trafficking of children globally. Uh, prompted me to make a movie with my uh, producing partner and writer-director, Edgar Bravo. And nobody came to us. We, we went research, fact-based, and made it into a fictionalized story that ended up blowing up um, last summer because of censorship that Amazon did on their platform when human trafficking was beginning to rise in the consciousness of the public when Maxwell was arrested and then there was the Wayfair and Amazon somewhere in between that without no warning took us off the platform. Um, I did a viral video, a, a video that went super viral last year in August um, talking about the censorship, but other things were flowing out that day. And I think it struck a nerve with people because I was talking about Hollywood and whatnot. And all of this time has brought me to you wonderful people that I would have never met otherwise, because I was out in LA in my bubble. And this whole disruptive time has brought us all together. And I'm very grateful to be here and now just started my new podcast, No Restrictions with John Paul Rice. I'm on Foxhole. Um, and I'm in production on another movie. So very grateful to be here. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And congrats on that, John. That's really cool that you're doing your own show. Um, my name is David Whitehead and I am a father, entrepreneur, martial artist by day, or at least I was before we got shut down. And uh, by night and by day now, I uh, do my podcasting. My main podcast is uh, Truth Warrior. You can find me at dwtruthwarrior.com. And then I also do a premium research project with the great Michael Tessarian over at unslaved.com. And I'm just a guy who is curious about the big questions of life, you know, like, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? And what the hell is going on in this crazy world? And I've been on that journey for, you know, seriously, probably the last 18 years of my life. Um, but I'd always grown up sort of being the outsider. You know, you'd find me in some used bookstore somewhere or some library trying to figure something out. And um, I've just always had that curiosity. And I wasn't classically educated. Uh, I was homeschooled as a kid. And then uh, I moved out of my house when I was 15 and got my first job and started, you know, forging my path. And so the work that I present on my show is just a collection of my own research that has been basically this something inside me has led me to these different fields to these different people down all these different rabbit holes. I've been interviewing uh, people from various subjects and backgrounds for many years. And I'm just thoroughly interested in knowing what the truth is because I just realize uh, that the truth is, is all that really matters in the end. We can all have opinions, we can all have beliefs, but in the end, the truth is always right. And so that's sort of the premise. And that doesn't mean I think I have the truth. This is, <laughs> I called my show Truth Warrior because I believe that this is a quest. This is a, a constant journey of unfolding. And also as we're looking at the external events around us, you can't help but notice that you're looking about, you're actually looking at internal events that are happening within you. And that was a big awakening that I had hardcore probably about eight years ago 
And I've been uh, really gearing my content towards that. So I'm super honored to be here. These, you know, these three people in front of you are sincere. Uh, we're all on this quest. We have many conversations offline. We're good friends. And uh, I believe that we are doing the right work. And I'm just happy to be here to support both of you guys. Beautiful. Excellent. And we were just speaking of it. We were just speaking off camera before we started recording about the silver lining of the censorship, right? There's a decentralization happening and it brings people like us together and other truth warriors. We need to organize ourselves. You know, I know, uh, David, you just got the platform on YouTube. I'm in 30 day Facebook jail again. Who knows how long it, you know, next time we'll be just uh, completely banned from Facebook. John just started his podcast on a uh, foxhole and whatnot. So that's amazing. Like, again, that it actually forces mm -hmm. us to organize, stay focused and really seek truth together and collaborate and co and really create community. I think that's the most important part, right? Yes. Nowadays to really stick together because, you know, before, you know, many of us, we've talked about speaking about truth and all of that for many, many years and nobody would listen to us, you know, and like, it's also, you know, when uh, nothing is really quote unquote happening, you know, people just go along in their comfort zone that, but now more and more people are being put out of their comfort zone, right? So yes. there is what I feel, there is an awakening happening, you know, without a doubt, a quote, great awakening, uh, because people start to question it, you know, it's almost an esoteric law, the more people suffer in a sense, the more than we really need to ask questions, and then people, um, you know, find uh, truth seekers like us, or, uh, you know, look for answers somewhere else, beyond the big tech and mainstream, because at this point with the censorship, maybe we can start here right now about the censorship, and what's really happening, right, especially with the vaccines and all of that. And, um, you know, so, you know, where, what, where do you guys, this right now, where is your focus on right now, you know, specifically in your own research? And what do you feel is most important to confront in the world right now? David, maybe start with you. Uh, well, I've always tried to keep my finger on the pulse of a lot of different uh, subjects or uh, topics, or what would you say, like different events that are happening and unfolding in different realms. Uh, we have what's going on with the economy, the political spectrum, the, the social world with all of the cancel culture, um, keeping an eye on uh, what's coming from the media. I'm also trying to keep an eye on the feedback from the public on the media. And I've been talking about this a lot, talking about silver linings. I live in Canada and Canada for the longest time, we haven't really ever have to been pushed up against the wall before. We didn't, we didn't have to fight for our freedom to start the country. In fact, our country was almost forced together. Many of the colonies didn't want to come together to form a country under the crown. So our country, and you know, we've just got an interesting history here. And there is, you know, the constitutional documents and the idea of, of freedom, but it is a vassal state of the crown. And uh, we are basically run by these big central banks, the Vatican, the Royals, you know, all the big mega corporations, just like everywhere else. But it differs from America in that we didn't have that spirit of resistance and rebellion and stuff born into us. We come from polite, high society, champagne socialism, that whole deal. And so we were slow to the punch. And so I guess I felt uh, there was an event that happened in Canada uh, I'm trying to remember the date it was around 2011 or 12, I think where there was a G20 summit in Toronto, Ontario, where I was living. And, uh, this was where Obama was coming in to meet all the leaders of the G20 and there were protests planned and they were peaceful protests. They were just people, families, kids, they were going there with balloons and popcorn and they were just singing the national anthem and, and going there in protest of our government meeting behind closed doors with all these foreign governments and not telling us what they were talking about. And what was interesting about that moment was it changed something in me to realize just how bad it had gotten in Canada, where uh, they had invested like $1.2 billion of our tax money into security structures and fences, almost like what we're seeing in DC right now, not quite there, but close. And they brought police in from all over to basically start uh, kettling and, and, and arresting all these protesters. And it became a massive human rights issue because uh, they were putting people in cages. They were grabbing people who were just leaving restaurants and weren't even part of the protests and putting them in solitary confinement for 72 hours. Uh, there was horrible, horrible rights abuses. And the world didn't really notice that happened in Canada, but a lot of Canadians did. And I think they never forgot. However, the media here started brushing it under the carpet, you know, oh, nothing really happened. Um, and it woke me up to say, okay, 
our government here is not as benign as the world sees it as. They think Canada is just a bunch of happy people. Um, uh, and it is, but at the same time, we had to learn that lesson. And then sort of fast forward to where we are now, I've noticed a sea change since that day, but it sped up big time in terms of awakening in Canada. It sped up big time in the last year because of the virus lockdowns. And I started watching the Canadian mainstream media and there's three major companies here, CBC, CTV, and Global News. Um, and they were all reporting on everything like, you know, the, the George Floyd protests in the summer, the lockdowns, Trump, and, and they're even worse uh, in terms of spreading stuff about Trump and all that and patriots than, this, than CNN, if you can believe it. And uh, I noticed just in the voting of the YouTube videos of these mainstream media channels that in the beginning of the year, 2020, it was like 80% thumbs up because everybody just kind of was like, okay, there's a virus. Let's support mm -hmm. our media. Let's support our government. Let's save everybody. Mm -hmm. And so everybody was really supportive. And then I just watched that change. I, I was in every single day I've been logging in just to see. And I saw that change. And now where we stand is this past, I would say, four months or so. It's now completely the other way around. We're 80% thumbs down to the point where the media has to shut down the comment threads, shut down the voting uh, abilities that you have on videos because it's just getting too obvious. So I've been tracking that because I want to see if Canada can wake up to that level, at least from what I see. Okay. There's still mm -hmm. obviously people who are hopeless, right? But uh, I'm noticing a massive shift here. And then when I compare notes with guys like you and other people around the world, people are reporting the similar vibe in the air that the censorship is backfiring. The moves that the government's making to say, oh, we got to now, you know, the, vi the coronavirus numbers are down because we altered the PCR test cycles, but uh, now we got variants coming in. So we got to keep locking things down. And then you got the UN talking about climate lockdowns and people are not responding well to that. Right. And that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of protests that are scheduled uh, coming around in Canada. And so I've been following that keeping an, uh, my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the US with, with Trump and Biden and all that stuff, uh, looking around the world and just trying to see what the hell is happening. So, And then also, uh, aside from the superficial stuff, paying attention to where people are at on their own spiritual journey through all of this, having a lot of conversations with people that I know and just seeing that a lot of people are breaking up with their spouses or getting closer together than ever before. A lot of people are moving mm -hmm. location. Uh, in a way that they'd never done before. A lot of people are moving out of the country or moving to different provinces. Uh, a lot of people are having these existential crises or uh, they're, they're trying to battle their own emotions. And a, a lot of my friends are like, I'm trying to stop drinking so much. I'm trying to uh, get healthier and, and try mm -hmm. to find a way to, to get my body back in shape because I've just been in depression this whole year. So I feel like people are coming out of uh, this dark mode. Um, and so I'm just trying to help with my content to do a balanced approach of looking at current events, looking at the spiritual psychological side of things, and then trying to think now about, okay, we need warriors for sure, but now we also need warrior healers. We need people mm -hmm. that can help fix up all the wounded, broken souls out there and mm -hmm. help empower them with knowledge and, and the information that we are, are so fortunate to have. So that's a nutshell of what I've been doing. Excellent. Wow. <laughs> well, that's a hell of a resume. Um, I took a totally different approach. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we love you, John. We need I unplugged, tools. man. <laughs> I said, F this, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> now, I had to come at it from a different angle because um, this, this is what, you know, Bernard and, 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 or Bernard and David were all talking about is that my personal journey to this time, which I'm not going to recap, but four years ago, there was a emotional disruption in my life, which was Sanders conceding, which for which I am was completely ignorant of him in terms of what his true intentions were. It's again, Collective consciousness rising in a pre-revolutionary time made Sanders and Trump the formidable candidates in both parties. Um, they just rigged it out of Sanders' hands. And, you know, I already know what the story is. So 
But I had an emotional disruption between Sanders' loss and conceding to Clinton and Trump winning, for which I was ignorant of what all that meant. And being terrified of Trump winning in 2016 and then being terrified of Biden winning in 2020. I mean, being inaugurated, let's put it that way, Mm. uh, falsely. And I just had all of my illusions shattered. So... And illusions being the ones where, for me personally, going into this time, the meaning that I drew from it was the awakening of of the child within me. Um, And so when I saw this time with the pedophilia and the human trafficking and all of that, that was coming to the surface. I mean, don't forget, we had Me Too. Epstein, uh, Weinstein to Epstein to Maxwell over three years. And then we had cuties and Hunter Biden. And, and then we've had the Lincoln project since. So what I'm saying is all of that unconscious trauma. See, when you have people in positions of power that are making decisions about your health, about your education, about your economy, Um, not just politicians and figureheads, but the people behind the scenes, the people behind those people, you, you feel as though unconsciously that you are bearing down on like that there's hell potentially awaiting you. And there is, there always has been, but you're finally becoming conscious of it. And so with me, I took this challenge. I dove into human trafficking, did my movie. And then I came through my own child abuse, which is not to say, oh, woe is me, because believe me, I took it on like a fucking champion to go after it. But I had that last illusion. And so for five days, I'm putting off in my head the current trajectory of everything. If Trump is not able to get back in what Biden means or the people behind Biden, it's not about him. And the agenda that they want to do for which I researched for the last four years, you see, so I know what they want to do to us and I know what they're trying to do. And I had to put death out of my head for five days because all of my terrors, the unconscious ones began to percolate back up. And it wasn't because I hadn't done the work. It was, this was the next wall that had to come down. Because it was all, for me, it was the pre-verbal and it was the, um, the stuff I don't remember. Be- but I can feel it and I can feel the tension. So I had to go up into nature for a weekend. I think David was the brunt of that phone call. <laughs> oh, that was a great phone call. I love our phone calls, John. All right, all right, all right. Don't but I, I, just, I just wouldn't shut up. And he was very gracious. And I love David because he goes... He goes, no, 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 just let me finish. <laughs> let, this, let me finish this one thing and then you can talk. <laughs> but I say this with humility to, for the point of, of, of going that I go, yes, I have more growth. Obviously we don't, it's not a destination. It's not a place you arrive at. It's a journey through and journey within. And so, um, it's helped. I've tried to use this time to let certain things that I don't want in my mind go, which is like just an example, AOC for me to give time to (laughs) Ocasio-Cortez right now is only going to make me angrier, reinforce my hatred of stupidity, which is my own stupidity, my own hatred of myself, essentially uh, beyond her being up, you know, next to me with a knife to my throat or a gun to my head, she can't do shit. And other than the rent that I allow her to live rent free in my head, you know, and so that's kind of how the approach I took, like, if I'm going to be a co-creator, I don't need to be co-creating with the majority of my energy going to negative things which give validity and make real even more the matrix because of my opposition and resistance to it. Same with my attachment to it or my judgment of it. And so I'm not trying to become this all holier than now. Oh, 
you know, everything's going to be fine. And no, it's like it, you have to live in both worlds. There's the world of the reality of where we are, where everything is in everyone's mind. And we're all on different layers of awareness, consciousness, expansion. And so I go, okay, how do I affect this in a way that doesn't kill me, wear me down, and take me out of the game? Because I've been through it for the last four years. I did it that way, and now I'm going to do it a different way. Because if I just keep going the same way, and all the horrible things, all the terrible things, all the worst things that could happen, it's like it's going to suck me out of the potential of what I could create what I could do in my own ignorant and retarded way, right? But I, but I realized, I said, well, God wants you to live. Whatever your construct of God is, God wants you to live at all times. So live, boy, go live <laughs> and try to do what you can to both enjoy and help. And so if you, it's sort of like coming outside of the matrix and then coming, if you're going to attack it, not really attack it, but if you're going to affect it in a positive way, you got to do it from a different angle, one that isn't offered in the current system. One that doesn't tell you to go into this position or that position. One that doesn't tell you who do you need to vote for or where you need to sign up and petition. It's like the, the decentralization part. It's the, you know, the band is breaking up in a sense, but it's going to recoagulate. And, and what people what I see people need is, I mean, we can talk about this today, but training wheels. Yes. But that's not like, that's not like a demeaning position. We're all refugees really in our own way. We're refugees of ourselves. We're <laughs> refugees of a system. And the, the, if, if everything continues to unfold as we see it, which I don't think that's the end result, but not because I'm speculating on something happening. But what I'm saying is trajectories mean that with each move forward that these people do, I'm just doing one plus one. One plus one says in 2016, Donald Trump was elected. However, he was elected because the previous group failed enough that he became popular enough to win. Which means that the same group now four years later is trying to do all the policies that were already unpopular in 2016 that got Donald Trump elected. Which means, and he got reelected legitimately, which that's not about Trump. It's about the collective consciousness where it's at at that particular time. And these are emotional shifts, not so much policy or political position shifts. Now, of course, that doesn't mean everything is going to stay together. It never is. Everything's always changing, is always unfolding. But what I, what I want to say is that I'm trying to work on myself in such a way that I can come back in a stronger way uh, that is not about putting my name out there to be some great guy and a savior. That's ridiculous. But it's actually to go, okay, what area of the world do I want to focus on starting with my own and getting really good at those things so that I can go out and give those things to other people and help maybe filmmakers tell really incredible stories that are truthful and get them out of that programming of imitating everything that Hollywood does, right? What, what would that look like if I could take talented people and bring them into a studio and say, all right, guys, you've got scripts, you've got writers, directors, editors, let's put all this talent together and structure it and organize it with projects and funding and scale it and start creating a new brand of content that people are looking for, but they don't know where to find it until they see it. So we've got to create it. We can't just talk about it. Anyway, that's, that's my spiel in the time. I, I yield back the, the rest of my time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That was awesome. That was awesome. Bernard, that was Can you beautiful. share uh, what you've been doing? Like what, what, what has your focus been as of late? I'd love to hear what you're up to. Well, um, you know, like the theme that comes uh, up, like as I was just sharing, is, as you guys were sharing, uh, came to me, it's really about 
what I also talk about, the inner and outer work, so to speak, right? The outer work is mm -hmm. the information, the research, spreading seeds of awareness, helping people, educate people through our, you know, social media outlets or whatever, podcasts and whatnot. But as you both noticed, the importance of inner work, right? The, you know, like even John, you shared it beautifully and on, on our last podcast and, and on your own show about your process of disillusionment. And that's what mm -hmm. people are going through, the process of disillusionment. Mm -hmm. And it's necessary. You look at any esoteric ancient teachings, uh, spiritual teachings, the core teachings, uh, it's a necessity of disillusionment. And that's what we're experiencing on a global level. And disillusionment, it's a great process because it means getting rid of illusion. And that's what our people are experiencing mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. That's a positive, you know, it's almost a paradox with the crackdown, the suffering and and the lockdown and all of that, people are starting to question their long-held beliefs. But disillusionment mm -hmm. is a destructive process. That's, you know, almost a process of enlightenment is at Yashanti Seed is a destructive process. It's getting rid of anything that is untrue, right? Yes. And it can be in particular painful if we have been identified with certain beliefs or certain views, right? We held our lives. Uh, you know, that's why I also see in my own work, you know, what I'm doing with my wife, Laura, we are very much focused on working with people in this with this inner process. We have a course mm -hmm. going on, Embodied Soul Awakening, where we take a group of 25 people through this journey of really, you know, what we call the holistic approach of the fourfold approach of working on all levels, on a physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual level, integral inner work, but in context of what's happening in the world. Because what I've seen over the years, you know, to generalize it, see default people, you know, can get too much focus on the external world. You know, a lot of court conspiracy minded people like calling out the matrix and, and can right. easily tie into shadow projection. You know, and like I can, what John talked about as well with AOC is a good example because I get also triggered by her. So and <laughs> we, can, what <laughs> we, we, can just start we all have to start like a council group, <laughs> an AOC withdrawal or an AOC uh, Alcoholics Anonymous type exactly. yeah. and, uh, therapy. But the point is like, you want to call out, you know, I have people accountable, you know, psychopaths and power, sociopaths and power, we know, but it's a slippery slope because when we project hate into them, right, then we just yeah. become that, you know, it's it's just a feeding mechanism. Something else feeds off of that, which goes more into maybe the topics I talk about, the hyperdimensional matrix, other forces feeding off this divine yes. conquer, and I, hating, hating each I other. I don't mess around know? with what <laughs> that stuff is they believe it let me tell you the the occults they do and they they feed off of fear and terror and your anger and yeah which I, then at the same time you don't want to go the opposite end the new age pill of just i'm going to just meditate on love and peace and just forgive <laughs> everyone we, you know the misapplication of we all one right the spiritual bypassing these high laws from a higher perspective yes we are all one but down here on a third density we are one but we are not all the same Right, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people are going with the people working with um, right now going through an intense disillusionment process. Right, so the stuff is coming up as you mentioned, their own wounds and traumas, relationships break up, family, husband, wives, and what people cannot relate to others. So there needs to be some sort of you know um, practical approach because you can easily get lost in the conspiracy rabbit hole, even the occult hyperdimensional. But I've noticed like. And I still struggle with basic inner child work. You know, John, you talked about this a lot as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, basic trauma work, that's what's coming up for people from this lifetime, many lifetimes before. And it needs to be brought to light to make the darkness conscious. You know, what's happening in the world is also a reflection of the inner, right? As above, so below, as within, so without. Hermetic, mm -hmm. you know, universal mm -hmm. laws. So what the dark night of the soul we're going through in, in the world is also happening within us. So we need to embrace that, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. To let it happen, to um, um, let the disillusionment process happening, but we need to support and help each other. That's very important. So, you know, again, going back to what I mentioned before, some people are overly focused on the outside world and not doing any inner work and then mechanically engage in shadow projection and projecting their own trauma somebody yes. needs in getting into into blame victim trap you know that's also how the matrix yes. tries to keep us on the other side of the coin i see a lot of people you know you can get also get too much into the the inner process can become a narcissistic self-indulgent process as well it's just me my wounds and all of that and i see this unfortunately i see a lot of people actually uh, have approached us that you know a lot of you know, well-meaning therapists, even modalities I follow and have been taught, and my wife as well, 
and these, uh, um, you know, even quote unquote spiritual teachers, I don't want to mention any names right now, but even people who have found it very um, effective psychological somatic modalities and processes, but they buy into the official story. Right, they buy into the the Trump hating and all of that, and yes. the social justice warrior and the virtue signaling yep. and all of that, and they uh, they then infuse their own conditioned belief system in within the the psychotherapeutic process, which is also not helpful. So what's <laughs> very important is right now is both the inner and outer work. There needs to be. And, and uh, you know, uh, deconditioning of of official culture of what we're being told, combined with the inner work, and that's that's the key. And it's it's a, it's a question of integrity as well, right? Because we know because of censorship, cancel culture, deplatforming, if you speak out certain topics, you may you know lose your job, you may lose your audience, you may lose your uh, um, you know your income and whatnot. So. But I think the deeper lesson is it is it is a lesson of integrity and, and acting of your conscience, and because a lot of people are still stuck in fear, right? That's the the how the matrix contains itself through the fear mm -hmm. frequency. That's mm -hmm. how you control people. That the coronavirus is a fear virus, more or less, and that's that's yes. what it comes down to. That's why people give away their freedom, right? That's why people are afraid to speak out because oh my god, what does the other person think of me? Uh, you know, the conflict, the backlash whatever, you know, concerns about jobs and whatnot. And I, I pre understand that and all of that, you know, but at some point we just need to stand up for truth. And what is truth? <laughs> uh, it's not just like in intellectual information. It's a process, as David said, like it keeps changing, but ultimately it's the truth of your being, right? This is what we want to access beyond all the trauma, the wounds, the mm -hmm. condition, the personality of who I think I am. It's essence, the truth of my being. And the more we access come from that, the more we then also affect the other world, right? Affect change, because like you said, John, we cannot just, um, you know, tackle the problem at the level it was created, so to speak. You, you just, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, Plato's allegory of the cave. You just engage in, in shadow dance and all of that. Um, but what, what you just said at the end, John, reminded me beautifully. And that, that's what I see with people. I've worked with so many people one-on-one -on -one and now with the group. Everybody's such a unique, beautiful individual being, right? And what I've mm -hmm. noticed, I've also noticed when I work with others, I need to also watch out that I don't project what works for me onto another person, yeah. right? So we can give advice, help others, but everybody has their own unique path, soul lessons, karma, whatever you want to call it, all these mm -hmm. are lessons anyway. But also, like you said, unique gifts. So everybody can con contribute something with their own gifts, creativity yeah. that is unique to you and nobody else could do any better. And that's what I see. That's why I love you guys so much. I see like, you know, you stepping up in your own power, creativity, David, you do what you do. I mean, I'm so inspired when you, when I follow you on Telegram, like the research you do, you know what I mean? And, and it's so structured, it's like a gift. You have a talent, even like I just, you even got out of your way and, and did the audio recording so people don't have to read it. it was a Nuremberg trial or something like that. I remember that. That's awesome. Like you're on the ball, even, you know, like to really help people. And it's, 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 it's very yeah. digestible. And like you just shared, John, with your own gift, especially from Hollywood and all of that is so inspiring to some somebody come out of that arena and your disillusionment process of being really uh, on the liberal left Democrat side and Sanders mm -hmm. supporter to where you're at now mm -hmm. and using your gifts, you know, within the film industry and, and, and creativity and, and help people, you know, spread seeds awareness. So yes. what I'm trying to get is that we all can, we really like, that's the silver lining. It really helps to step into our own power and creativity and contribute and, and help people wake up through whatever ways. Yeah. Um, something I wanted to add to what you just mentioned, and it is, it is easy for us to kind of get lost in our own way and our own bubble, how we see things, uh, because it's, it works for us. Right. And when you go out into the world, I mean, I, I, I have a practice. I go at least four or five times a week to this coffee shop in a little town where I live outside of Atlanta and, um, they don't wear masks. They don't mandate that people wear masks in there. And, and Georgia doesn't have a mask mandate except for businesses and stuff, the larger ones. But what it really, what really is touching is that I'm dealing there with young entrepreneurs in their 20s and some teenage girls that work there and teenage boy. And then their customers that come in, they're all from different walks of life. And 
one of the things that was really beautiful is that, so it's like this, it's like you have all this knowledge and awareness inside of you, but if you keep it only there and among the people that you're with, then it really, what you're doing, I, I, I understand why people do because it's familiar and you're accepted, but it's not like going up to somebody who doesn't have any access to what you're saying or understanding of where you're coming from that you can begin to talk to them, but it's really, it actually goes into the Bible. And some of the things that I've learned from spiritual teachers is like, no, go be with them, get to know them on their level, as opposed to your level. And it's not one better than the other. It's really the, the, uh, understanding that we're we are all the same but the knowing of that is when you can be with somebody listen to them and hear what they're trying to say and then see what you can to give to that where they're at because if you're the person that's you know 20 steps ahead in your mind to the person in front of you will give them uh something that they can eat something that is food for them today if, if you're dealing with somebody that you see is starving and is hungry and is asking for your help, or at least you could give five seconds of your attention to, to help. If it's a, a musician, I, I know this is normal life for people, but it's just to realize the preciousness and magnificence of everything that is going on simultaneously in spite of the matrix. It's that's the that's thing that, that breaks the illusion for everybody because Yes, if they're fearful and terrified and you're fearful and terrified or you're angry or you're upset over something that has nothing to do with the present moment, both of you are out of the present moment and both of you will come at each other unconsciously. Mm. And so nobody's being heard, nobody's being served, no real authentic human interaction is occurring and it just continues to reinforce the disconnectedness that we have. So it's not like you going around and being, you know, some, I am so great and good. And I'm just, gonna, you know, but, but what I told one of my friends um, who does really intense work with satanic ritual abuse survivors and yoga is I said, look, we can look at all of the horrors that are going on and all of the terrors and the agendas and know all of it inside and out. And we can go and lecture and speak on it inside and out. But what she and I and others in our ways are doing, I said, I told her, I said, let's just say there is fertile soil out there and we are spreading seeds because Everyone is living their own lived life, lived experience as they have explored it, understood it, and experienced it. And even if I were to put myself in that person's shoes for an hour and live that person's life, I would not have the totality of everything that they have witnessed and processed and experienced. So it's it's really goes back to just fundamentals of kindness, where if you really... I mean, I'm not saying it's about you or anybody else, but if you're truly this enlightened, loving person, then walk amongst the earth and give to others so that they can, be, they can find comfort in the humanity that you are, that you have found greater than what you knew before. And that's not a, what you should be doing. It's what you feel to do. That's because when you feel it, it's when it's the most authentic and that energy, frequency, and vibration of the giving and the act of what you're doing is, is conquering dimensions that we don't see. I'm not trying to be so mystical about it, but what I'm saying is you broke through the program and you made a direct connection to the human being that you were thinking lesser than before when they op until they opened their mouth or until you asked the question. And that, to me, is, is the challenge for a lot of us because we can get so familiar with ourselves and our ways that we know everything, and it works for us. But it, to do the real work, I think, is to create the meal for people. And the meal is within you. The community, the space is within you. That peace is within you. And if you look at it as uh, you wanting to help people, understand that there are more refugees on the way 
and there will be many more. But here's the thing. If all we're doing all day long is staying in our space and being good, and we're right about all of our opposition to everything that's going on in those agendas, and we're not out there creating, then all those refugees are going to be just like us pointing at the problem, but have no solution, mm. no answer to it. And that's to me where if we were to change this time, we go and we create and build on a mass scale and put our efforts together, both in our talking and our doing and the products that we're producing, like Foxhole, Edge of Wonder TV, Dauntless Dialogue, your podcast, David's, it starts to just grow and grow outward and outward. And more and more people want to come because it's an authentic, honest place where everybody is trying to understand things yet at the same time help and give light to a lot of things that are very dark, but dark, not on the global scale, but dark for people who are blind, who are unconscious, who, when I talk to an actor and they ask me about COVID protocol that I'm going to do on set, I say, no, we go with the facts. We turn around, we tell them, we go with the facts. And we say that since the beginning, the CDC and others have said, and everybody seems to forget this, and we've come all the way back to asymptomatic people do not transmit the virus, period. And if they do, it's such a low, 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 low level and has to have long-term sustained contact with the individual. It's not airborne like they want you to think it is. So we have lost our minds but to give that sanity back to an actor or an actress that I'm going to work with or a crew member, I'm going to say, no, do you think I would take a risk with my life just so I can make a movie? I'm just saying what, what I'm doing is I'm putting out there the truth, but asking in a form of a question that the individual can answer either in their head or to me directly, but they will see me say it and they will see that I am not trying to convince them. I'm not trying to make them uh, believe what I believe. I'm giving a space for them to come, a bridge that I am building, so that as those seeds are planted, more and more people begin to ask these questions. It is going to, it's going to recreate a new consciousness in people versus being told who's their enemy, told who is wrong, who they need to listen to, what they need to obey, you cut through all of it just by giving and offering something and ask the question. Anyway, I, I, I wanted to that because you mentioned that about our own place and our own space. And I see that in the spiritual community. I see all the things that you describe, and we can talk about that later about cults, but the importance of this time for all of us is to, is to find the kindness within yourself that is real because it's what everybody wants. It's truly what everybody, the world is starving for it. They're starving for the thing that they don't have, which is love. They've been taken out of it by this policy. All these policies have separated everybody. And there's been a massive disruption over four years in everybody's life, especially in the last 18 months. So it, it's, it's like a, I'm trying to say that these current trajectories that other people are on are not going to end well, but we can help. Like you said, when we get pulled into that, understand how hard it is to pull ourselves out of it and look for people who may be lost, but are, are looking for kindness. And even if we can give it to them in a, just a moment, it's one more connecting point that they have in their life versus not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, uh, well, and, <clears throat> and that's just, first of all, this is already just such a, an awesome conversation. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to this, like I'm listening to a, one of my favorite shows. This is great. Um, I just wanted to say a few things as I was listening to those points and they were great points. The one thing that I've always felt important to bring into this field of research was all of this, the, the different mindset and the philosophy that was, that I found in the warrior tradition and the martial artists and, and whatnot. And, um, Bernhard was talking about anger and the misappropriation of anger and how we just, we become what we hate, you know, and that's what we have to be careful of. And that's what the media is trying to, uh, spur on and instigate mm -hmm. is they want us in the streets with guns and smashing things. They want us to become the radical left. They want us to be like them. 
because they feed off of chaos and war and destruction. So, but at the same time, we can't uh, lose our humanity. And, and there's something my colleague, Michael Desarian brought up a long time ago, which I have always really just loved and I've integrated it into my own philosophy is this idea of the two different flames of anger. Real anger, righteous anger that is fueled by the same anger you feel when we hear about something like child trafficking, okay? Mm -hmm. You can't repress that. You can't ignore that and you can't uh, try to do away with it like we see so many people in like the new age religious community trying to just like, oh yeah, that's not happening. I don't want to hear about that, right? Mm -hmm. the, the anger that you feel, there's a blue flame of anger and there's a red flame of anger. The red flame of anger is more associated with your ego and, and the idea that you're just going off and you're reacting because you feel threatened and you're trying to go into defensive mode and you're, uh, you, you see something you don't like, so you just attack it blindly. True righteous indignation takes discipline. And this is a huge element in the martial art tradition that they're trying to instill in you is with great power comes great responsibility. Don't do away with the fact that you need a mechanism to defend yourself in this world. Welcome to earth. It's not ponies and rainbows. Okay. This is an earth school. This is the school of hard knocks. All the lessons you're going to learn in this plane are going to be challenging. They're going to be tough. They're going to draw on your spiritual, your psychic energies like you wouldn't believe, but that's how you hone that rock into a diamond. That's how you create the blade of a katana through fire, through pressure, through, you know, forging it and smashing it and folding it thousands of times. You create a perfect blade. And um, the other concept is the fact that the sword, if you remove the S, it's word, the word, the logos, right? Our sword is our tongues, is our speech. This mic is our weapon to convey truth and to convey authenticity, and to convey with discipline that righteous indignation that is actually a sign that you haven't been put to sleep. So as much as people don't like sometimes the rough, hard school of uh, you know, somebody that's, that's bringing that true passion and that, that, that fire to the, to the fore, and maybe it's just because I'm an Aries and I, I live in this, right? I love that. But it, there, I wanted to differentiate the difference between going off the handle in, in just feeding into your emotional uh, needs and thinking like that and the difference between that blue flame of anger. If you look at a, at a flame, mm -hmm. you have the base of the flame is blue, the blue flame. It's the hottest part of the flame, but it's the most controlled part of the flame. The red is the one that flips around everywhere, and that's, that's the example. So it's a good analogy, I think, mm -hmm. to show the difference there. And then the other key I wanted to bring up always is that everything is based in balance. And I see people often, and especially in the intellectual uh, professor university level, where they go off into extremes and they create entire ideologies and philosophies on whiteboards that are in one extreme or another. And that can be useful because you need experts. You need people who are specialists in an area to hone in and bring out a concept so that you can compare it. But people get drawn into it and then that becomes the basis of everything they are. And they forget about the other balancing side of the yin-yang that you need to have at all times. And notice that the, in the yin-yang symbol, it's actually a sine wave. It's not a straight line, right? The materialist scientific Cartesian model is a straight line of white, black, right, wrong. Like it's all that. But the actual movement of nature is a sine wave motion. And I can attest to that even from the physical training of martial arts. And I'm sure people that do dance or complex movement, gymnastics can attest um, where the most effective movements are, are based in that balancing force, which is why the yin yang is prominent mm. symbol in the martial arts. And nobody crystallized the points uh, better that we were talking about than Morihai Yushiba, who was the founder of Aikido. And I think that we need to use Aikido and Judo and this, this principle of, of not attacking, but building a system where it's when you're under attack, whether physically, psychically, emotionally, as we are right now as a civilization, we don't hit them head on with uh, an, uh, an ego-based response. We block and counter, we move and counter, we turn the attack against the enemy. Yeah. That's, the yeah. that's harmony, right? That's nature. That's not because people that always had problems with, I don't like violence. I don't want to hurt him. Well, <laughs> psychopaths out there, they're going to grab your kids. They don't think the same way. So you better, you better have a way of defending yourself. Okay. We can't right. be weak in the knees here. And so I have a quick little quote 
from Morihei Yeshiva. It's one of my favorite ones. And John, I'll, I'll send you a link to the book and you too, Bernhard. You can yeah. even share it with your audience. My favorite book on more, that Morihei Yeshiva wrote, you will love it. And he says this, he called it the art of peace. So he called martial arts, the art of peace. And everybody's like, well, what, what are you talking about? You're slamming people on their skulls. And it's like, no, the art of peace. Here's how it goes. The real art of peace is not to sacrifice a single one of your warriors to defeat an enemy. Think about what's going on with Trump and everything right now too. Vanquish your foes by always keeping yourself in a safe and unassailable position, meaning prepare yourself each day, put on your spiritual armor, but not the ego armor that is just you going, I don't want to hear anything. There's a difference, but you, you're in a place where you're unassailable, okay? Then no one will suffer any losses. The way of the warrior, the art of politics is to stop trouble before it starts. It consists in defeating your adversaries spiritually by making them realize the folly of their actions. The way of the warrior is to establish harmony, which is the result of that balancing force. There are no contests in the art of peace. A true warrior is invincible because he contests with nothing. True defeat means to defeat the mind of contention that we harbor within and I'm getting goosebumps reading that, but I will throw that <laughs> to both of you to respond here. No, that, that, that's awesome. Well, wow, that's amazing. So, so many things just came up to me. Um, the bit about anger, I love the analogy between the blue flame and the red flame. You know, I also see with anger, righteous anger, the way I see it, it's, it's great anger. It's, it's an, because anger is also creative force. It, you know, it's a creative energy if used constructively as initiation. If you just linger on it, then it can become toxic, but can initiate right. for change, right? Um, but I was thinking uh, with all of what both you guys said, like there's, there's a prerequisite, I think, for the spiritual warrior, so to speak, and speaking truth, helping others, connecting to others, which mm -hmm. ties to the basic of self-work. And the basis of self-work is to be uh, the ability to observe yourself, Mm -hmm. establishing the inner witness right so we know why we do what we do so we don't just become reactive when we get identified right away with our emotions and act mechanically or identified with our actions but we're able to observe ourselves and even discern why am i doing what i'm doing and even mm -hmm. i can relate to this so sometimes my anger comes up and i get pissed off i by the way i have mars and aries so this is like <laughs> I, I, i'm not the one to shy away from conflict let's put it this way i just had to learn to choose my battles wisely right yeah that's the way <laughs> i'm with you on that man trust me so, uh, but you know i can see as i observe myself sometimes the anger comes up is righteous anger because of you know standing up for other for 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 you know, even it's even like a slippery slope standing up for the victim because you know you get into victim blame the the trauma triangle of like perpetrator victim and, mm. and persecutor and all of that right but where is, is it really coming from i can see sometimes my anger comes up actually is related to something from my childhood and not speaking out of being bullied and now the outside world has to pay right and something mm. gets triggered you know i mean i can not to generalize, but all the TDS, Trump derangement syndrome of people hating on Trump is psychologically based on a father wound, <laughs> right? Yes, that's, that's, it. That's, that's that's really what it comes Big down time. to. Huge, right? So yeah. just knowing that, you know, that would also like basic shadow work. If people would just understand the basics, like fundamental Jungian shadow work of triggers and projections, we would already live in a much better world. Mm -hmm. you know? And the archetypes <laughs> too, yeah. The archetypes too, wishful thinking, right? But that's the key point, you know, especially for, you know, a martial artist, like you have to, the control of your emotions and your behaviors, actions is based on self-observation, right? To stay contained. Similar what what John mentioned, like if we want to meet somebody else and affect them in a positive way, we have to have the certain self-awareness or what Gurdjieff called self-remembering. And that's really higher state of being, self-remembering, meaning you're completely aware of your inner state, your physical, psychological, emotional, uh, you know, impressions and the outside world at the same time. <laughs> Right, so this is like this this high yeah. level of being, and it's not a mental concept, right? Self observation can you can get into analysis paralysis if you're very head centric, right, and confuse yourself, but it's just an inner awareness where you're more grounded in essence in your truth of being, and then you see your mechanical reactions that can get you into trouble, or you know how easily you're being just you know that. Uh, uh, manipulated by other forces, which goes more into the occult and all of that. But having the ability to really observe yourself and knowing why you do what you do. 
You know, I can see myself, I can be reactive on social media, like, fuck, you know, my passive aggressiveness comes out. And then I can see then sometimes certain posts were based on my own childhood wounding and this and that. And some sometimes something else is coming through, but it requires a certain level of humility as well. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted you guys, what came to me, I want you guys get insight onto that as well in terms of reaching others. And I totally love what you said, John, of but being, being able to connect to somebody else's essence. That's really what comes down to it. Not seeing them mm -hmm. as this personality of beliefs, but the, the, the truth of the being. And that's kind of like, especially with the lockdown, obviously they make it harder to meet up in person, right? It's mm -hmm. easier to project right. online. Everybody's tough online and this, you know, and, and, and a lot of people, you know, say things to others online, which they never say in person when they call people mm -hmm. out and all of that, they're all and then anonymous cowards on the online, so to speak. But, you know, there's certain levels we can reach and we want to connect and open up. But I know from the esoteric traditional, what Gurdjieff called, there's also something to be said about external consideration and strategic enclosure, right? Because mm -hmm. some people are so gone, let's say, or removed, distant from essence and being and so conditioned that they become a threat, right? It's a typical Agent Smith syndrome. Right, so with mm -hmm. people we cannot immediately reach, right? So we need to also protect ourselves from, and um, you know, or defend ourselves from. So I want to know, you guys, inside what how you guys feel because on some level I sense there's some sort of like splitting happening in, the, in humanity, and I'm talking it in a natural sense in level in light of the evolution of consciousness because with eight billions or seven billion of people, there are vast different levels of soul embodiment, levels of consciousness. And we mm -hmm. cannot assume that everybody is even capable of doing that inner work right now in this cycle, you know? And I don't mean this as a better or worse value judgment, just as it mm -hmm. is, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the mm -hmm. artificial divide and conquer agenda of pitting us against each other, right, left versus right, and we know that. But there's mm -hmm. also something, so we said there's something natural happening as well, which we, we need to acknowledge Like certain people, we need to respect free will, right? We cannot force others to wake up. We need to respect the free will of people to stay asleep, <laughs> so to speak, right? Yeah. And check our own ego, not wanting to wake up people out of force because nobody has woken up us with force, so to speak, of force to read this, you know, wake up, nope. can't you see the lies? <laughs> yeah. So how do we navigate? I think that's a lot of people ask us, well, how do we navigate you know what people also call the Karens of the world, right? I apologize mm -hmm. for anybody who, whose name is Karen. I don't know how they originated. <laughs> so. well, I've actually had, a, a, there was a woman that came on my Twitter and started doing the Karen thing and her name was actually Karen. I was like, it's kind of funny. So there you go. She embraced the role. Exactly, there you go. But how do we navigate, right? Like, because I understand we need, with our frequency, we can affect others, but sometimes we need to just also like, you know, put in the warrior, Right. And we cannot just go around, you know, kindness, absolutely. But sometimes we need to like, hold on, back off. Boundaries are necessary. Right. So how, mm -hmm. how do we navigate the, the scenario, so to speak, in this day and age? Mm -hmm. I have a quick uh, thing I would say is just maybe it's my personality. I don't know if it's correct. Philosoph I don't know. But uh, I just have a thing where it depends on how I'm approached. If somebody approaches me with constructive criticism or um, even if they completely disagree with something I'm talking about, but they just, they show up in the right way, respectfully, not, not kissing my ass, not being, I'm not asking for that, but just, you know, they're there to maybe learn about more about my opinion and they're there to share their opinion and they have contradictory information. You know, maybe they want to share a Snopes.com article or something, <laughs> um, whatever, then go right ahead, go right ahead. But if somebody approaches me with that attitude of just conflict and bullying and pushing and trying to start a fight, I, you know, you got to pick your battles, but you're going to get a different side of me is what I would say. And that's just me. And maybe there's parts of myself I still have yet to perfect, but it's just, it's part of the thing. It's like, it's my martial art policy. I don't go out and start, you know, Ipon Sayanagi, someone into the freaking pavement just because I want to. And because I can, it's uh, it's something that I would use only in an extreme circumstance where either I'm practicing my art or somebody attacks me. And if you attack I can't promise that you're going to survive, you know, like I, but I wouldn't do anything maliciously. Right. So I guess I have that same policy when I'm online. I don't have a, I don't have a lot of tolerance for trolls. 
Um, I don't have a, I don't have tolerance for people that come with that bullying mindset. And I think that that needs, that's that masculinity. That's that positive masculinity, Mm. not this toxic thing. They're trying to program everybody with where you just say, no, I'm not here to be a whipping post, but I'm not here to be a jerk. I'm not here to say that I'm the one that has all the truth, but you have to come with some level of respect. And if you can't have that, then the lesson you need to learn is one of those school of hard knocks lessons. Like I've had to see so many students go in, you know, when I'm teaching students and I've had guys come in there and they're these big dudes and they're just like, you know, they, you know, they, they don't have the respect in the beginning and they are always like, well, what if I do this? What if I do that? And then they try to, you know, even when I'm using them to demonstrate a technique, they get extra like punchy with me. Um, Well, yeah. Then they end up, lying on their backs, wondering what day it is. And it's just the way it goes. And now that never happens again. And uh, so that's just where I come from. I come from the warrior school. So I have a little bit of a different output. Other people would go, no, let's sit them down and rub their back and give them some warm milk and try to pull out all their traumas as a child. Sometimes you don't have that kind of time, you know, and I don't know. That's just where I sit. Bernard, Bernard, uh, can you ask me the question Again, specifically. Yeah. <laughs> no, <basically. laughs> no, 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 no. I think Dave is a, it's a great answer. I just like, I got lost in your answer. And then I was like, I don't know what the question is. No, no, but also referring to what you said before, John, before of kindness and reaching people to, uh, you know, to find, yeah. to find that essence within them. And I agree. Like I see this, you know, when Laura and I, my wife go out with the doggy and meet mm-hmm. people out there, you know what I mean? And it's beautiful. I just meet yeah. as human beings. I just don't try to impose. I'm just, you know, uh, carry a certain frequency, engage even in, in small talk. I'm not right away. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about the COVID vaccine? Right? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know right now who I'm you talking know? to. And I saw this, <laughs> this elder couple, and they, they are from Canada, actually, right? And they're here in, in Sedona. They, they, we call them uh, snow, but they, they just escaped Canada to be in the warmer region f- for the winter. Right. And they're mm-hmm. just, they're the lovely people, really nice people. And they said, yeah, we just got the COVID vaccine finally. You know what I mean? And I like, yeah. my heart was sinking down because we like them so oh. much. You know, we still like them. They're, they're great human beings. But I'm in this yeah. moment, I'm not like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, da, da, da. I'm not going to go off right. in what I usually do on social media or my writings. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, I feel this external consideration, like, oh, okay, good for you. Kind of like almost, you know, yeah. I don't want to impose myself. Because I can right. see they're just like, they're um, beautiful human beings, right? They're just deeply conditioned, right? And really mm-hmm. concerned. They're mm-hmm. older, but um, they're not evil people. They're just very misled, right? Right. right. And right. and even though I would like to say something, I know in this moment, I just cannot do it, you know? So I'm right. just trying- Well, because what is the outcome, right? What what? How are they going to take what you just said? and reconcile it with what they just did exactly you know so like where how are they supposed to feel or think after you tell them that and how do they respond to you right and then they oh well thanks for letting me know after the fact you know or whatever it's like have you ever heard heard of phrase? or it just creates the content right it totally does and when we What's really interesting and unique about what you said is that we have not encountered on a mass scale with new eyes for the first time. We have an alternate reality that we see very clearly for the first time in front of us. And it has serious implications for the future of humanity, at least if not not just us today, but them now and in the future, because they're doing the right thing to them in their mind. They are doing the right thing. Exactly. Mommy and daddy told me that I need to get a shot. And I didn't know that Bill Gates was involved with Jeffrey Epstein for 10 years because nobody told me that for which I would then have questions Oh, and he was also involved with Peter Nygaard, too, who got arrested in can. Oh, oh, shit. Okay. I don't think I should really take a vaccine from somebody who's telling me to take it that was involved with two pedophiles that have been arrested on charges. Do you see? But that's what you know. Yeah. And this is the challenge of this time. And I don't for a minute think that the people who run everything aren't aware psychologically of what they have done. Mm. And because the, the response will not be uniform. 
do you see? Especially as things unfold. And that is a very challenging position to be in because I've had people too that actors and others that are excited because they got their second shot and now they feel comfortable to be able to be on set. And I love them. So it's, it's one of those things that is what I believe is this, what the higher essence that is with us is like this. You don't have the capacity, but God has the capacity to have unconditional love for all of his children. And if you look at it that way, then you know that God is going to do everything in its power of its own essence to help that person through their lived experience. And this is maybe, to me, it's an opportunity during this time to see how fragile we are, how precious we are, how incredible we are. And those individuals who find the compassion within themselves and the empathy within themselves for themselves and the unconditional love within themselves and for themselves truly can help the most because even though they have their own contradictions that they're working on, they're conscious of them and they understand that their contradictions are the same model that is working in every single person, awakened and unawakened. And so while it's heartbreaking to know that because the potential for what could happen in the short and long term is unknown, and you know who the players are, and you know what the program is, and you see the separation, what you're talking about, your, your original point. You see this split happening right in front of your eyes, not just politically, but socially, consciously, emotionally, mentally. And we've never had this time where the social cohesion of a society has been so ripped apart by this time, mostly through the media. And to me, it says, well, you have a choice now because this, this for which your friends are in or your family members are in or your strangers and your neighbors are in, is a ship that has already set sail a long time ago. Because if you really look back at what has happened to people, it's quite astonishing the realities of multi-generational trauma that is going on and why these people who run this place, I'm talking about the world, understand who and what we are and that every moment that has been available to them they have used to head off the rise of consciousness. They have used false flag events, fake presidencies, Manchurian candidates that people believe in because they're ready for it. Remember what Obama was. Why was Ron Paul popular during the same time? Twice, 2008, 2012, rise in consciousness. So... What these people have done is on 9-11, they fractured society in one way. And by eight years later, they had rag radicalized it politically, not, not seeing the full effect of what was going to unfold. But the point being is that they have created multi-generational traumas by massive psychological events, 9-11 to COVID-19 and everything in between. And everything before that. So you have the boomers and the Gen Xers. Then you have the, the millennials and Gen Z. And we have three surgical cuts that have occurred. And so what's happening is that each lived reality in the time that they've been alive, like for the last 20 years, 
I, I, I mean, I understand why people are mad at radical leftists, socialists, communists, um, anti-establishment, anarchists, BLM, Antifa. But here's the thing, and this is not an excuse for their behavior and their damage that they've done, but they grew up in a world from 9-11 to now. They did not have a foot in the analog world, didn't know what the 90s were. If they were children, maybe. But their whole adult lives have been, in the last 20 years, this shit show. And so with the indoctrination, of course they hate capitalism. Look what it's done to their families under the current regime. They don't see the deception going on. They can only go with their reality, which is right in front of them. And so to me, the rise in consciousness during this time requires like all the things that you and many others have talked about, the shadow work, the inner work. There is a purpose and a reason for it in the greater benefit of humanity because there are going to be many who are going to be sucked in you and I are a, I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm not saying this about Trump people or anything. You and I are a rare minority of people in the, in the bigger picture of the world. And the reason why people listen to our podcasts and our shows is because we stand out from all the other bullshit. And it's like, these guys know something I don't know. Or these guys know something that I need to know, or maybe I need to know it. And it's very important, the responsibility, like David was talking, like you were talking about. Somebody told me, says, John Paul, you know, going forward, just choose your words carefully because everything that you speak into existence is being taken in by people who are listening to you. And even though they have projected onto you certain beliefs or ideas about who you are, which is not to say they're wrong, but they don't know me personally. So that responsibility that I have, if I'm going to give something, let it be the truth. Let it be something that's fundamental and enriching to each individual in their own way, even though they may make decisions that I strongly am against, and there may be serious consequences as a result of that. Our response to this time um, as best we can see, is really what is defining what will happen. If our, if our, if if it is, if it is like you know, feel the what I'm saying is feel the frustration and the anger, but then go okay. This is not helpful to me to be angry and mad both at them and their ignorance or even their stupidity because I may have told them not to do it or somebody told them not to do it and they didn't listen and they got scared. Who cares? It's done. So it's like, okay, now what can I do? Treat it like if you're a parent, treat it like a child. This is your child. If you wish to, this is your child. What do you do? Even if it's not your own child, if it's a child in itself, say, what do you do with a child that you love and care for? You help it. You don't sit there and say, well, you didn't do this, 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 and this, so now I'm going to punish you further. And, that, and, and by the way, I'm your friend. I'm, I'm your authority figure. I'm the one who cares for you by telling you all the bad things that you've done and how disappointed I am. <laughs> you see? There's re-traumatization of the whole thing. And what it, what it requires, and it will, we will be forced, is it will require you know, those who have looked at the depths and darkest places, both outside and within themselves, to be able to help so many people who will fall traps, fall into traps of the arguments, this side versus this side. And if you give them a lifeline with just your care, Every day going forward in a real way, not like, oh, I need to help you now because you're, you're one of those people. No, it is, it is incumbent upon us to bring through more care 
Because if if you believe that the vaccine is going to hurt them and that they're going to die or they're going to be in pain, you're going to need to be there to care for them if they're your friend or your family or somebody else that you supposedly care for. Because when that moment comes and you say, oh, you didn't listen to me. I'm sorry. I can't help you. Then you really never could, did care. You really never. It was all preconditional mm-hmm. on agreements. So. I don't know. That just kind of came out of me, not about you, but about how when you ask, like, what can you do? It's like that compassion has to come from you. And it goes, okay, I know what I'm dealing with now. So what can I, what can I do in this moment to affect something good? I can listen to them and I can be there with them. And I can, I can even give more to a different conversation. I can bring in, let's stop talking about the vaccination and let's talk about the good stuff and what's going on in their life and try to draw that out of them so that they don't read that fear in your eyes and that judgment as because it, it will pull them back too. Yeah. And then there's a missed opportunity for the continuing of their beauty of their life as long as they can enjoy it. And as long as you can enjoy it, because there are no guarantees, <laughs> you know, that's the thing. It's like we, we make these prejudgments on future states of plans of where we're going to be positioned in opposition to others, and it's all an illusion as well. I mean, that's the crazy stuff because it's just like, well, what do you mean? Do I have to dissolve all of my reality? No, I don't want you to. But in steps, you realize that your own conditioning has put you in a place of opposition to everyone. And, and it's not everyone else that's the problem. It's these other jackasses over here that have all the money and power doing that to us. I mean, that we're, we're, we're letting them dictate to how we're going to treat our fellow human beings before we've even spoken a word. Mm-hmm. We're worried about, you know, what this black person over here has been told that if I don't wear a mask, I'm trying to kill them here in Georgia. And um, if I act like an asshole... And I don't communicate or like do normal human interaction stuff. If I just ignore them or I give them a slight or I have a negative thought in my head or I, whatever it is, all I'm doing is reinforcing preconceived notions about people that I don't have any knowledge of individually on an individual level. And then I playing right into the hands of the tribal warfare and the, and the identity politics when I don't even believe in that shit. So it's like, you see what I mean? It's, it, it's those kinds of things that if you could just pull back just a tiny bit and realize, my God, everybody is trying here. The effort that is going into making the world as it is right now, in spite of all the shit that they've put on us, that everyone is still trying. And what David said is very important. The flow Go with the flow, flow with the flow, and then find the moment where the flow turns in your favor and then turn it back around to help Mm -hmm. come full circle in that movement. That's what I think you both are talking about is because it's, we have to recognize our own ignorance and our own judgment and our own attachment and our own resistance within and of the moment outside to be able to reconcile the two. That's what I'm trying to learn right now. And I'm seeing it more and more and more that my battle, my struggle is their struggle. Their struggle is my struggle on both different contexts, different dimensions, but emotionally, mentally, it's still the same. We're both children trying to make sense of both the past, present, and reality, consciously and unconsciously, simultaneously, according to our own lived life and experience. And if you're more aware of what's going on, you can assume a responsibility, which is not about your greatness and amazing abilities of what you can do because you're so enlightened. I'm not, I'm not saying it about anybody, but I know people can go down that road. I've gone down that road. <laughs> and And what it does is it defeats the very purpose for which you are on that path. Because what David was talking about and you've talked about is that, I mean, there's not a word I can use to describe it other than oneness. 
And it's such a massive and big thing that, you know, people try to conceive of the world in oneness. And it's like, no, go to the fundamental levels. Where did we all start? Where were we all born? Everybody is seeking love. Even this dysfunctional person over here is seeking love. And they can't find it because they have these problems. Now, it doesn't mean that I have to go over there and save them and rescue them. But if, I, if this person comes within my way and I feel the need to say something or do something, I will with the intention that I see my own struggle in this person. And I, I know the struggle that they're under and I could say or do something that would, here's the, here's the trick. It would put me in a very more, much more vulnerable position than the person who perceives me to be this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that, that gives them the opportunity to begin to open up. It's like me saying, I understand. I know what that feels like. I've, when I was in this situation, it felt like shit. And I was so mad and I didn't know. And I just, I remember doing all of my unconscious behaviors. And if I could go back now, if I knew what I, but it's like, it's like, here's the seed I can plant because I have, I have grown a vegetable in my garden on this one. Yeah. This one I've grown. You know, when I just uh, want to say, it, it reminds me of like with the the what I mentioned before. Laura and I were doing the the group processing and and our inner work on on online course, and we do group sharing, and people share about you know they're really you know find a safe container and they share things with us they had never even shared with their loved ones. You know, the deep trauma and they start processing, crying, whatever's coming up. I truly it, each time I do processing with others, I see myself in that person. I yeah. can relate because I had similar thing, you know, like different maybe manifestations, but I've been through that myself. I can see it. I can see the wounding. And you mentioned before, like the majority of the extreme left Antifa BLM, they're severely traumatized kids, right? Yes. And where yes. pathology is becoming normalized. We can talk about this as well of transgenderism and all of that. Mm -hmm. That's and pathology is becoming normalized and externalized that somebody else's fault, right? That, that it's the age of the victim. That's the whole social justice warrior, um, mm -hmm. you know, ideology. But what I want to get you guys to take on, as well as like with all we talked about, but we obviously see big tech and the media MSM is trying to is obviously demonizing individuals like us, right? Mm -hmm. Deplatforming mm -hmm. us, censoring us. We are what are we? white supremacist, right-wing, anti-vaxxers, conspiracy nuts, and all of that, everything is just, we are a threat mm. to humanity. <laughs> mm. That's really, you know, the picture time to, to paint, and that's how then people believe, right? So mm -hmm. how can we, like, because as I see the silver lining, the beauty of us connecting, decentralizing, and talking, but is there a danger of just preaching to the choir, choir, choir so to speak, right? Like the echo chamber, mm. so to speak? How can we just... Uh, have more impact on 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 the masses on the bigger picture so to speak David, well, anything? you, you gotta you gotta think of it like this in my opinion that if you build it they will come mm. uh, i learned that from I, I have worked in nine different dojos uh working in there managing some of them and then owning some of my own in different places i've taught workshops in different areas where you would have different demographics of people And basically, if you think about it, the fact that they're trying to create this, these two groups of people, one are basically those that just listen blindly to the government, the media, and follow all the rules of big tech, which change every day. Um, and those that are thinking for themselves and looking into these things for themselves and caring enough to spend a significant portion of their time researching these things and introspecting on these things. And, um, and so obviously the oligarchs, the cults, the people that really, you know, are trying to run this in the direction that they want to benefit them. Uh, they need to create that. I mean, that's how sociopaths operate. I've met many of them who, uh, who will create that where, well, if you don't follow every single dictate that I give you, then you are a traitor to the group. And this is where collectivism comes in. And in a certain way, this whole thing about only at the precipice are people willing to change or, um, you know, you have to be put up against the wall in order to be able to see the truth sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. we, have, we have to be comfortable with the fact that we have to allow this to happen. 
right? In a way, like there, there's bigger forces at work that are beyond us. So all someone like myself can do is create my content centered around the issues that are important to me that I think are important and that I'm called. I follow my, I follow a calling. I follow my inner intuition and my guide uh, as much as I can. And I produce work in that way. And if, if, if I create it, like you've created your show, Bernhard and John, you've, you got yours, we've got people building other social media platforms in the world of all this censorship. What's happening is that people are naturally leaving Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and going to find Gab, Telegram, Foxhole, et cetera, uh, naturally. And it's actually getting to a point where I think I saw a stat where Telegram has something like 500 million users, whereas Twitter is sitting around 350 million users right now. I, people can fact check me on that, but I know it's significant. And look, mm-hmm. when was Telegram created? R- within months, right? And <laughs> just wait till Trump starts his, it's going to be the end of them. Uh, and the reason is, is that even though we see people that are just hopelessly plugged into the matrix, for lack of a better term, the media matrix, the mockingbird mind control generational system of how to <laughs> control the narrative, uh, we still see people exiting that. And that to me is a huge sign that despite the censorship, despite the cancel culture, despite the Hollywood elites you know, weighing in like anybody cares what they think on polit- political things happening in the world, despite all of that, the late night comedians, the Snopes, the fact checking websites, all of that, masses of people in numbers we've never seen before. And I've been monitoring this for about 18 years personally in numbers we've never seen before are giving the bird to those companies and organizations and to their governments. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, and they're, they want to come here and they they're on different levels of awakening, but they've at least reached that place where they're no longer just blindly trusting (laughs) known liars Mm -hmm. and criminals, as I like to call them. And they're starting to think for themselves. And in a way, if you look at the big picture, this is all necessary. And I hope in our lifetimes, we get to see some major victories. And I believe we are. I think we're close. I think there's going to be some major shifts within the next six months that are going to blow people's minds. And that's not me reading some boards or any, that's just gathering all the data the best I can, listening to my gut, talking to astrologers, reading into it as best as I can. And I think we're in for some big waves because of that. And what we're at is, I also look at it from a combat scenario and I'll give you a quick example. When you're in a fight, and I mean, not a street fight, you're in a strategic battle with another trained martial artist, okay? You're in there, you're dealing with someone that knows what they're doing, you're dealing with somebody that's well-conditioned, so they're not going to get tired easily, they think strategically, they're very difficult for you to, to win over, right? So in that mode, you, you, start to, you have to be able to analyze it in the fight. So while you're defending yourself and you're doing your exchanges, you still have to be able to look at the big picture and then zoom in on the small picture and then go back to the big picture in, in nanoseconds. And you have to train mm-hmm. yourself to be able to do this. And what happens is you start to notice what's working and what's not. <laughs> Sometimes it's as simple as you just notice your opponent is out of breath or they're swinging too wild or they're opening up more than they were before, which you can take in one of two ways. If somebody's throwing calculated strikes at you or techniques Um, they're a little bit harder to manage because they're so pinpoint, they're so precise. But when you notice them opening up for bigger strikes, one of two things is happening. Either they're panicking and they're desperate because they're tired or you hit them with some good shots or whatever, um, or maybe it's part of their strategy. But when you start to take notes of that and realize how you can adapt to that and you get that instinct and it becomes an intuitive thing where you know when they're on their last legs, but they're faking it. They're trying to prop themselves up as I'm coming at you with everything I got, but really they're desperate because they're wounded and they're losing. Mm. I see that process happening right now with government, with the big tech, with this narrative, it's falling apart at the seams. So they are now forced to be more draconian, more Mm. tyrannical, Mm. more overtly totalitarian and more evil in the end, right? They're, the evil is, is becoming more evil and it's becoming more obviously evil because it has to in order to contain that level of awakening and moving away from that system of control that is happening. Mm-hmm. So this is the good news that people need to understand, in my opinion, just from me looking at it from my perspective, is that 
there's all, they're, they're in checkmate and there is a reason why nothing can stop what is coming. Mm-hmm. There is a reason for it. It's not because Q said it. It's not because anybody said it. It's because right. you just have to look at the nature of this thing. When, cause when you're fighting evil, you're fighting with your hands tied behind your back. Okay. Especially cause evil, usually that side of things controls the narrative, especially in this world right now. But if to, in order for that to switch, uh, we have to go through this process of the divisionary split. That was, that has to happen. That's natural. You're going to have some of your best friends and close people that are going to go along with what the media is saying. And then other people that are on your side about it, but that's going to keep changing. And because of the fact that people of their own will are leaving the big platforms, turning out of them, turning off the media and thinking for themselves, that's the process that can't stop, can't be stopped. And all people like us have to do is be facilitators and create platforms and create content and, and connect and create networks uh, that, will, uh, that will be able to take on that burden of what I think is going to be the hundreds of millions of people that are going to be starving for information as they wake up at one point or another. Some people woke up in the beginning of 2020 and smell the rat right away. Some people halfway through when the, when the protests were going through the streets in the summer and it was so blatantly obvious that uh, why are we allowing and condoning this when we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? Um, when all these co- contradictions keep adding up and they're going to get worse, they're going to get mm-hmm. more obvious because there's nowhere else to go. It's like a chess game. There's only so many pieces on the board. There's only, only so many moves left. So they have to keep pushing this more and more and more. And uh, as that happened, that just wakes more people up. So we don't have to force anything. This is a natural process and truth has a frequency and a will of its own, right? Nature has a, has a path of its own. God or the divine intelligence has a path of its own. So we just have to stay out of the way and make room for it. We, like Thomas Paine said, you know, all truth ever needed was the liberty of appearing. It does its own thing, but we just have to facilitate it and then welcome it in and it'll do its own thing. That Holy Spirit or that force will do its own work on those people. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do anything. We just have to keep doing our work. And that's why Bernhard, your channel's growing. I know it. John, your channels are going to grow. My channels are going to grow. All these channels are going to grow, not because we're doing some magical work that's making it happen, but literally because we are standing out of the way of the enemy, letting them fall on their own sword. And we are just here to help clean up the wreckage and the pieces. And Mm -hmm. so that's where I stay optimistic. And that's why I believe Mm -hmm. nothing can stop what is coming. Beautifully said. (laughs) Awesome. No, that was amazing. It really ties into what I also realized that, um, Everything, like you said earlier, everything happens exactly as it needs to happen, and there's nothing wrong with reality, right? right we can right. easily get play God or this shouldn't be here. This no, we we don't in our little minds don't see the bigger picture. And I'm not just talking about possible strategy behind you know military and whatnot, but the much bigger picture, which you like uh, uh, talked about, which I call divine will. Nothing can interfere with divine will, and mm-hmm. things need to play themselves out, but we cannot see ahead. I mean, we are, you know that's I withhold. You know, it's always the issue of making specific predictions. All specific predictions have failed. That's why I stopped from it, yep. doing it to begin with, mm-hmm. right? But there's something happening. There's a trajectory. And in, uh, in what you also describe is basically high-level game theory. That's really what it comes down to on multidimensional levels, right? But beautiful way to finish the first part, you know, let's um, take a little break. And then I want to get in more into the, the second part, maybe more specifics. But I'm I'm curious about you guys' take on on Trump's speech at CPAC and whatnot. Um, I want to definitely look into like what your take is on on Q and all of that, which is you know the, the, somehow the media is still completely obsessed with it, which is very interesting. <laughs> Trying to do specials and documentaries about it, um, and also I'm really interested in going deeper, like what what John uh, mentioned. Um, you know, like. As, it, as it's been building up over the past decades, but even going back longer. And I was really uh, fascinated by the post you made, um, David, on Telegram asking the questions, how much do we really know about the true history of this planet? How this is an agenda, not just 8, 10, 20 years, but thousands of years. And we are kind of mm-hmm. like at the end game, so to speak, on, on, a, on a much different level, right? So sure. we'd love to explore that as well. And... Um, Again, for 
anybody who wants to access the second hour for any members, if you're not a member yet, please sign up at veilofreality.com. Also gives you access to the membership forum. And again, just for our listeners, real quick, uh, David and John, Paul, where, where can they find you? Uh, if you go on my website, dwtruthware.com or unslave.com, you can get access to pretty much all those channels. Uh, I'm on Telegram, Gab, Rumble, BitChute, Podbean, um, Foxhole, and soon to be, I'm setting up a really cool uh, system with a new platform called Rockfin. So I've got more announcements coming on that. Yeah. Uh, I can be found at, my work can be found, my film work at norestrictionsent.com. It's No Restrictions Entertainment. And if you want to find all of me on social media, as well as all the different projects and resources that I have linked out there, you can find me on Linktree forward slash no restrictions. Beautiful. All right, you guys, we'll be right back. <laughs>